name is Rita and we're reaching there and this is hashtag IP series welcome to IP series guys so if this is your first time listening to my podcast I'd like to say thank you for listening to my podcast don't forget to favorite my podcast don't forget to share and like it as well what we do here is talk about recent intellectual property cases which could take the form of copyright trademark patent industrial design trade secrets geographical indication and plant varieties for my returning listeners you guys are the best thank you so much for always coming back to listen to my podcast it means a lot to me on today's episode i have a very 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 interesting topic and case to talk about it was one of the most viral cases within the last two weeks uh, i know it took me this long to re- record it but it was totally worth it so yeah i'm going to introduce you to my guest for today um so yeah stay tuned <laughs> okay great so welcome to today's episode i have a special guest with me uh, i'm just gonna let him introduce himself and tell us what he does all right so Rick, my name is Rick Sanders, to you. and i am a intellectual property litigator uh, here in nashville tennessee and i uh, practice law with tara aaron and um, the only other interesting thing about me is um, I, I did teach copyright at Vanderbilt for a few years uh, while they were kind of prof- between professors. And uh, otherwise, um, our law firm, Aaron Sanders, has been around since 2011. I've been practicing law since 2000. I started practicing at Fenwick and West in Silicon Valley, and I'm originally from Silicon Valley, but moved uh, uh, to Nashville in 2004. Fantastic. So I'm, I'm actually interested in the fact that you're an IP litigator. But yeah, our case study for today is the Google and Oracle case. And it said it's been on for about 10 years now. Can you give us like a brief history of the Google well, and Oracle case? Um, so this case, mm-hmm. as, as you point out, was filed way back in 2010. Uh, at that time, uh, before then, okay. uh, uh, Google and Sun were uh, discussing and, and uh, the discussions were becoming increasingly antagonistic about leasing, uh, excuse me, licensing um, uh, Java uh, to uh, Google, which was at the time had just acquired Android and was working on the Android operating system. Sun was reluctant to to sue. Sun was at one time a giant of Silicon Valley. When I practiced there, they were they were huge, uh, but they had fallen they had fallen on hard times. And, Interesting. Um, they they had a, a a pretty unpleasant uh, antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft in the two thousands. So they didn't have a lot of stomach for a lawsuit, but they got acquired by Oracle, which always has a stomach for lawsuits. And then Oracle sued, but it was mostly a patent lawsuit. Um, Sun, I think, had a lot of reluctance mm-hmm. to enforce, to try to enforce its patents on, um, you know, that that affected the the, the job of virtual machine. Uh, but Oracle uh, didn't mind so much and uh, sued. And I think that's an important point because the case was mostly a patent lawsuit, and the copyright part um, was was during the trial, the, the initial trial was pretty over overshadowed. Um, and then, and then there, there was the, a first trial, first jury trial, and Oracle mostly lost. All mm-hmm. uh, the jury found against Oracle on all the patent claims, and then um, and then would have found in favor of Oracle on copyright claims, but the judge decided that. Um, the copyright at issue, and we'll talk about that in a minute, was not protectable as a method of operation. Mm -hmm. And this is very famous. The judge um, had actually taught himself uh, Java in in order to sort of learn about the case. Um, 
and and uh, and and so he decided well, that it was a method of operation. Um, and then also the jury split um, on question of fair use. Okay, so why was the claim on the patent infringement dismissed? And how come the copyright um, infringement became the main focus and not, you know, the two forms of yeah. infringement? That's so the patent and the copyright. Because um, we don't know exactly uh, why the jury decide what they do. Uh, juries are um, boxes. The information goes in, judgment comes out, and we don't really know why uh, the jury uh, found no infringement. It was a non-infringement uh, ruling though it was not they didn't invalidate the patents i don't think it, they just felt that whatever google was doing um did not read on the patents and so the copyright piece sort of starts to take over and that's the only piece that gets um appealed uh, oracle does not appeal the, the patent um uh, uh, jury verdicts which perhaps indicates that Oracle mm -hmm. thought it didn't have a very good chance, but it did feel like it had a good chance to get a reversal. Um, it got appealed to a funny court. If you're not familiar with the U.S. Co uh, federal court system, normally you would appeal to a, a, the, the nearest, ge geographically the nearest appellate court. Um, and that would normally be mm -hmm. the Ninth Circuit. But because it was a patent case, it got appealed to a court that has subject matter jurisdiction over all patent disputes. Um, even though the patent claims themselves are not being appealed. And that's called the Federal Circuit. And the Federal Circuit, it's, it might look at things a little differently because they're used to looking at patents. And they may have uh, tend to look at copyright a bit like the way they look at patents. Um, yeah. So do you agree with the decision of the court that Google's use of the 11,500 lines of code was indeed yeah, I, a fair use? I, I try not to, to express an opinion because I, I really want people to make their own, make up their own minds. But yes, yes, I do. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm less convinced about um, the whole method of operation uh, ruling which was reversed i think that was probably appropriately yeah. reversed um because uh, but um the same arguments play kind of differently in fair use and uh i think um i think i think the court here uh, weighed the factors um more or less correctly i've got my little quibbles but more or less the 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 decision makes sense to me Okay, so how does the fair use principle operate in the United States and how is it applied when it comes to the various types of well, copyrighted works? So one sense I, I get when I hear people from other countries talk about um, their equivalents of fair use, uh, sometimes called things like fair abridgment or, um, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, fair dealing. Is, is that ours in the United States might be a bit stronger. Um, it certainly has deeper roots. Okay. Um, I mean, it's been, a, it's okay. been around, well, arguably since before the, you know, since it maybe goes back to British um, jurisprudence, but the, the version we know and love goes back to about uh, the 1830s. And, um, and this may be a reflection of uh, the... Uh, our, our First Amendment, even though there is no First Amendment defense to copyright infringement, um, our our, um, our tendency to, to protect free speech may may enter into that. Um, and the way it's mm -hmm. always been applied, right, is is these four traditional factors, which go all the way back to the eighteen thirties, uh, and we'll go through them. And you're supposed to apply them, but the, the you know the the issue has always been that fair use is very results oriented. That is, the judge has a tendency to kind of decide who's supposed to win 
and then sort of apply the factors um, based on that result, which is why you find a lot of, you know, it seems like every fair use decision is four factors to zero when you would expect, you know, some close calls, but judges, once they make up their mind, is they decide that all the factors have to uh, support their decision. Okay. And so you're how, not supposed to yeah, go ahead. Like just tot up the, the factors, like how many factors go this way, how many factors go that way. You're supposed to kind of take them all together. They're, the factors are not even uh. inclus exclusive. Uh, there could be other factors, although that's extremely rare. Um, and, and then the, and so it's, it's possible, for example, for one factor to totally dominate the other factors. Again, judges don't like to do that, but they can do that. So can you tell us about this, um, four factors so of the, fair use? So the four factors that is, was applied. Uh, traditionally they go in this order. However, just giving you a, a heads up, the court does not apply them in this order, but traditionally <laughs> The first factor is you look okay. at the infringing use, that is the, the defendant's use, um, what they did with the, with, with the uh, mm -hmm. underlying work, and look at what, what they were trying to do with it. We call that the character and purpose of the use. And the next thing is we look at the underlying work. We say, well, how, cl how, how close is that to the sort of core of, of what copyright protects? Right. Copyright protects a really wide variety of things. It's supposed to protect originality and creativity, but some things are more original and more creative than other things. And we tend to weigh against fair use those things that are closer to the core of copyright. Third is we look at um, how much was taken and how important what was taken was to the underlying work. So you could take a lot, but if it's not very important, that factor may not weigh against fair use very much, but it is also possible to take the heart of the work, a fairly small amount, but it's very important in underlying work, and have that factor weigh against fair use. And finally, the fourth factor, which is the effect that mm -hmm. the use has on actual and potential markets for the underlying work. And this is always been the hardest to apply everybody says it's traditionally it's always been it's been the most important that has fallen out of fashion now but even so it's always been super hard to apply because it's you, you, one tends to fall if there isn't an established licensing market as there often isn't courts will assume one and then kind of fall into a kind of circular mm -hmm. thinking um, if only this person had had a um, a market they would have exploited it the, the, the issue with the fourth f f factor okay. is that if, if you expect actual markets, actual attempts to license the work, that penalizes artists who may not be that interested in the business side of their art. You know, they just didn't do a good job of exploiting markets. That seems unfair. But at the same time, if we don't know what the markets are, it's very hard to apply this factor. So that's so the fourth fourth factor is just it's always been important and it's always been really hard to apply. Interesting. So is this to your in your own judgment now? Is this a good uh, one for the software industry? How has it impacted the software industry going um, forward? Well, this is this is interesting about software um, because it's gonna it's going to um, hurt about half the business models in software and help the other half. Uh, software is an industry okay. that is, relies on copyright, but is often at odds with copyright, even more so than um, even like art industries. Um, many, uh, like, you know, the, the oracles of the world, they they depend on and they, they count on fairly robust copyright protection for their software. Software is not well protected with, by, by patent. This case may be an example of that actually. And, um, and of course, many software developers can't afford patents anyways. Uh, 
So a lot of companies will depend on copyright protection to, um, you know, to make money. Um, but the other, you know, half of software is a very small, agile uh, business that has, you know, is very used to uh, collaboration and borrowing and may have a hard time understanding what copyright has to do with any of this. Um, not all software engineers even think in terms of copyright are often surprised to learn that their code is protected by copyright when, you know, they think of copyright as really things for like books and movies and paintings. Um, and, and they just don't care. And they would prefer yeah. a world in which um, this wasn't an, a hindrance. So I'd say, you know, that helps half and hurts the other half. Is there a difference between API, computer programs, and software? So, um, I'll, I'll, st I'll um, start with computer program because that's actually defined in the Copyright Act. And the program would be mm -hmm. the actual lines of code, the actual characters that uh, make up um, a, a program that would instruct a computer. And that could be at the very high level, like source code, or it could be at the very lowest level, just the zeros and ones and all the levels in between. And that is considered a literary work. And that's technically what is being um, protected when we say um, uh, a, a computer program. Uh, now, APIs are um, really just, in that sense, uh, little computer programs that are stored uh, in one place together in a library and can be called on by different users or different programs. They're, they're sort of shared resources. Um, and now what was interesting mm -hmm. about this in a software, I think is sort of a general term and we tend to use it in just um, uh, opposition to hardware. It's, it's just whatever it is that isn't um, part of the equipment that makes the equipment uh, you know, do what we want it to do. And obviously that would include you know, computer programs. Um, so the terms are often, you know, interchangeable. Now, what's interesting in this case is that Google, um, right, you, you've heard, of course, the APIs had two different kinds of code, right? You had your declaring yeah. code and your implementing code. And the implementing code is the, is the code that actually instructed the computer. That's the actual instructional language. Uh, in the a in in each of the APIs, and Google wrote its own without reference to the original APIs, which you're allowed to do, right? Because you know it's not copyright infringement if you don't copy. Um, the declaring mm -hmm. code told the computer and, and the programmer um, where in the library you can find this API. Java is a very complicated um, system. It has a really big API library. It needs to be organized uh, in, a, in some way. Uh, the more intuitive, the better. And ultimately, w the copyrighted issue in this case was just the way that API library got organized. That organization mm. then gets reflected into this declaring code because you, you, have to, you have to basically say where in that organization uh, you can find this API. Um, so I, I've always thought it was easiest to think of this case is really about organizing the API library, library. I recognize that the court, both sides, the dissent and the majority tend to look at it in terms of lines of declar declaring code. Okay. So how has mm -hmm. tech, technology, affected copyrighted works in this um, so, current era? I, you know, it's, 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 um, it's almost a cliche now to, to say that 
copyright has not kept up with technology <laughs> and that technology keeps knocking copyright askew. Um, and we haven't had a significant update to the United States Copyright Act uh, you know, since it was passed in 1976 uh, and enacted in 1978. In fact, the last, um, you know, the, 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 the two really significant updates to the Copyright Act both were both responses to technology. The first one was the part of the Copyright Act that explicitly brought computer programs in as protectable subject matter, although it's widely believed that they were protectable even under the older act, the, the previous act. And then the DMCA, which was a way of dealing with the internet. The biggest change, right, the one that, that just causes all the other problems is the digitization of content. And, you know, this has been a, you know, sort of a slow moving train wreck since the 90s. More and more content has been, you know, turned from its analog forms into digital forms. We originally saw this with, you know, things like Napster in the late, um, in the late 90s, as music um, was digitized and internet speeds were just fast enough to allow people to download a song or two. But internet speeds are now faster, everything is digitized. This cuts both ways though, because anything digitized, and this includes software, has to be copied once before you can enjoy it. So you, you don't you, you don't um, you don't need to copy anything when you, uh, when you read a, a regular book. Or you just pick it up and read it. But software needs to be copied at least once from where it's stored to where the computer can actually process it. Um, and that copy has been you know software industries lever right they can prevent you from actually using the software you paid for um because they can take away your license to make that intermediary copy that copy that's necessary to enjoy the product that you paid for and as things become more digital we keep you know this this starts to extend to books and movies and other things that we bought that we thought were ours and it turns out they're not ours they're all under license. Those licenses might, for example, have territorial um, limits. We, we've heard stories of people going to a new country, finding a lot of the books on their Kindle are gone because the license doesn't extend to the country they, they're currently visiting, for example. And that messes a lot with a lot of the assumptions of of copyright it messes with the control over making copies right that's always been you know a, a a break on um on infringement because it's just physically hard to make copies so most people didn't go to the trouble and it was also the way that you made money you controlled all the copies now it's almost impossible to control those copies and it's trivial to make copies it's trivial to infringe. Um, leave it at that just to say that, uh, uh, you know, the scarcity model technology is undermining the scarcity model. Um, it's, it, it makes infringement um, more likely. A lot more pressure is being put on fair use just because we can now do more with, with content, things that you know, courts had never really considered before, like, you know, mashups um, uh, or, you know, imagine how popular uh, just, just YouTube channels that play computer games, which clearly involves copyright. Is that a fair use where I'm doing a let's play? You know, um, most copyright owners try not to sue their fans, but um, there's just a lot of, a lot of uh, questions and the Copyright Act isn't really suited to address them, but at the same time, you know, what's the alternative? It would be to ask Congress to address it. And do we, do we really trust um, you know, our current sitting Congress to really get their heads around 
um, you know, the, the whole the whole technology situation and come up with a, um, you know, a new set of laws that won't become outdated, you know, in one year, right, when technology moves again, it may be that we just can't, we just can't have a, um, a, a you know, a perfect copyright law. And, and, and if that's the case, then fair use is just going to play a bigger and bigger and bigger role uh, in, in setting the boundaries of, of copyright. Hmm. So um, for our final questions, I know when we're talking about technology and how it's affected copyright, you did mention how IP, as copyright is territorial in nature, um, do you think this case can be applicable to other jurisdictions, knowing fully well that it's a U.S. case? And what trends should we look out for um, post Google slash the Oracle case? And what final words do you have? I think to, to you know, is this case applicable outside of the United States? A lot of that will depend on how uh, other countries have been applying copyright to software. Um, not everybody thinks that's a good idea. I don't think every country necessarily um, does that or has, has, has thought it through. And, um, you know, if there's one, one takeaway that the United States and everybody could maybe think about is, is, is copyright even a good way to protect what we want to protect in software? patent is too expensive and has its own problems. Mm. Copyright seems to not protect the things that we think are most important to software. Maybe software, maybe the solution is to have a separate regime for software, which after all is a, um, you know, as a category of technology isn't going anywhere. It's not about to become outdated. Um, and then you know, what, what, what are the trends? What I'm going to keep an eye out for are cases. There have been a number of lower court cases uh, that have found against fair use. And I want to see if they reconsider based on this decision. I think this, this, this decision is meant to be applicable to all forms of copyrighted material, not just software, but it also made it very clear that the 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 type of of work matters a great deal in how we apply the four fair use factors so for example a lot of us have a, our eye on um i believe it's the goldsmith case the one involving um uh, andy warhol's uh prince that involved a photograph of prince so it's prince of prince yeah um right and yeah to see if yeah. If that court at least reconsider, re, you know, recasts its fair use decision, it might come to the same conclusion, but does it at least realize that the way it analyzed um, the fair use in that case is a, is a little bit at odds with this new case? Or are they just going to say, oh, you know, Google is just about software and we're just going to cabinet, we're going to limit it to software. Uh, I think the case is clearly meant to be applicable everywhere, but, you know, we won't really know until we see how the lower courts react. And that's kind of the first one um, that we're all looking at. So, um, so for example, in, in looking at trends, uh, one thing that we're all going to be looking at is this... Uh, uh, is the Goldsmith case that involved uh, Andy Warhol's making of multiple prints of a photo photograph of prints. Um, the Second Circuit had found that not to be a fair use, reversing the, the, the trial court. Um, I think that decision, the reasoning is, is um, not consistent with Google versus Oracle, which came out just afterwards. Um, so we're going to be looking to see if the Second Circuit feels like it needs to at least adjust its reasoning. Um, okay. I, I'm not sure I, I'm going to expect a you know 
for it to change its mind, but I, I'd like to see if it changes, um, uh, at least addresses Google v. Oracle in a principled way, or, and this is the other possibility, you know, are they going to just regard Google versus Oracle as just a software case and really only applicable in software cases, which would um, limit its applicability uh, quite a lot. I think Google versus Oracle was written uh, to be applicable to all fair use cases, but um, you know, it, it's possible that it will just get relegated uh, to uh, just the software sidelines. Okay, great. So what I, what final words do you have for software developers out there? Um, how can we reach you if you have more questions for you? Um, well, my email address is rick, R-I-C-K, at aaronsanderslaw.com. That's A-A-R-O-N-S-A-N-D-E-R-S-L-A-W.com. Um, mm -hmm. I also, uh, Tara and I maintain a blog on our website, aaronsanderslaw.com. Um, and then we have a contact form on our website as well. And, oh, my, my Twitter. I'm on Twitter a lot. Um, so it's at Rick Sanders Law. Um, I, don't, I don't, honestly, I don't check Facebook very much. So Twitter's, if you've got to use social media, it'll probably have to be Twitter. <laughs> Great. So it's been... Um, a fantastic time having you talk about this case. I know from the Nigerian angle, I think it would have passed off as a fair dealing case or it could have been the judges would have held that it was an infringement, but then it all goes to the facts mm -hmm. and what the parties will have to prove. But it's been fun having you on the case. Thank you for honoring honoring our invitation to talk about the Google Oracle well, thank case. Thank you so much for having uh, me on your show and yeah. uh, for giving me a chance to talk about uh, really what's become one of my favorite topics to talk about. Yay! Great. So it's been um, a fantastic time having you talk about this case. I know from the Nigerian angle, I think it would have passed off as a fair dealing case or it could have been the judges would have held that it was an infringement, but then it all goes to the facts mm -hmm. and what the parties will have to prove. But it's been fun having you on the case. Thank you for honoring honoring our invitation to talk about the Google Oracle well, thank case. Thank you so much for having uh, me on your show and yeah. uh, for giving me a chance to talk about uh, really what's become one of my favorite topics to talk about. Did you like this episode? I hope so, because it took a lot of effort from me and my guests to actually record this particular episode. I hope you continue to listen to my podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and favorite my podcast so you don't miss out on any episode. And please don't forget to share as well. Until the next IP series, see you guys and... Cheers.